Okay. So, let's begin. The last lecture, which is quite, I think, very interesting to me. So, what I'm going to do today is build an application that is somehow able to detect my my hand. I will have some cheating objects here. I will show you soon. And I want to do the gesture that you see in the Spider-Man show. And when you do that, yes, then <laughs> I want web to go somehow. Now this web is going to go kind of like a string. And when it's going to reach the side of the, of the screen, it's going to stick to it. So that's going to be the idea. And if I'm going to do something like that, then I'm just going to put web everywhere. When I stop doing this gesture, I want the web to stop, but remain attached to my hand. So that even though it's connected there, I still want to be able to move it like that and maybe continue to do it again. And when I'm going to do this, I'm going to cut it. I'm more or less going to delete the, the entire thing. So that's what we are going to try today. And. Um, And we're going to divide the lesson into two parts. So the application is first going to detect these different gestures. So like that, like that, and like that. And then in the second part, we're going to generate the web. Now, how to detect the gestures? I have this thing here. <laughs> so <laughs> more or less. What it's going to be, it's again a colored pointer like in the Doctor Strange lesson. So this is the part where the web is going to come from. This red, green item here, red in the slides, but uh, don't worry about that. Now this is going to be the moment when the web is actually going to shoot. I encode two different things here. I encode a direction. So two points define a line. You should remember this from geometry. But if you see, one of them is bigger than the others, than the other one. So I also encode uh, not just the slope of the line, but also the direction for the velocity vector that the particles are going to be shooting from. Now, this thing here. I just try to be smart. It only covers the other one. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be the moment when the web is attached to the hand. I could have also done this. So this and this are equivalent from what the computer sees, but I think that this looks better to have the hand gri gripping something anyway. And then when I want the web to be removed, I do that. So things start to disappear. OK. So now that we got this introduction part out of the way, I'm going to start the lesson with the code from uh, the first half of this Doctor Strange uh, it's special effect, this portal opening effect. If you remember what was happening there, we had a colored marker like this um, green thing here. Now we're going to improve to something better. And uh, in this first half of the lesson, we could just draw this polyline, and the polyline was somehow uh, chasing itself, like not lasting more than two seconds on the screen. Um, I'm going to use this as a starting point, so not the full uh, portal opening uh, example there. I don't have here anything about roundness computation or the actual visual effects, so that's in the part two lecture of this, uh, of this portal opening thing. But I'm just going to use the, um, this detecting the, the pointer part of the code. And I'm going to use the second canvas here for the experimentation of the web, web part. So we begin with this. And um, yeah, just as a brief reminder of what happens here. So a selected color, in this case the green color, 
uh, default is um, going to be found in the image so that the, um, uh, so that all pixels within a threshold to this specific value are going to be considered as part of the object. I can also select a different color, for example, if I have this blue marker here, if I click on this blue marker, okay, yeah, so if I click on this blue marker, now blue is the default color. So click interaction with the canvas, I will preserve. And the distance under the threshold was not just in the RGB color space, it was in the LAB color space because it worked a little bit better. So. Let's see how this code looks like and what we will keep from it. Recapping now the code, I'm not going to use this polyline object anymore, so I'm not going to draw lines in this application, I'm going to do something else. I can remove it entirely from here. And then uh, here the move pointer. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit more. So we also have here updating this polyline, drawing this polyline, so two things that we won't need anymore. Then initializing the camera, yes, we will still keep that. Drawing polyline, not needed, and also this update polyline based on time, not needed. I think all the other functions I'm going to need so here, drawing pixels in blue that are belonging to the selected object. This is just for the debugging purposes. Uh, if we have locations, we create a, an event for the pointer moving. Function for identifying the, per, the, um, the pointer if the distance is be, below a threshold. And then vector manipulation, so linear algebra here. Initializing canvas, clearing, drawing line, and the color conversion, the color space conversion. So this is what we are going to work with. But now uh, I want to, well, yeah, let's change also the title of this. And refresh the page to see if this is still working. Console should be open in case there are some. So now, yeah, polyline is not defined. I'm still using this polyline object somewhere. Uh -huh. Okay, let's still display this point. For example, um, using a circle, like draw a circle. Uh, on the canvas, so the canvas is now here in this e.target uh, attribute. I'm going to make it a little bit clearer. So I'm going to put a circle where the pointer is on the first canvas. I'm going to mark that location with the circle on the second canvas. So the location is also attribute part of the event and let's give it a radius of, let's say, 5. Okay, and this clear canvas has to come before so that not many circles are accumulating. The polyline, we won't need it anymore. And uh, the draw circle function is actually something we don't have on this code I just realized, but I can make it hopefully easily. So, location and then radius. So the draw circle function, I'm going to use this draw line function as a, as a sample code. So initializing the context, beginning the path, there is no move to or line to here, there is just arc, I think, and then the first two parameters are the location, the first and the second component of the location, and then what was next, there was the radius, which is a parameter, 
Oh yeah, and then we had two um, this zero and math dot pi multiplied by two. Uh, I want to have a full circle. This is what this part is saying there. Okay, so I saved the file, refresh the page. Okay, so just to mark the location, I'm using now that draw circle function, and it seems to be okay. Yes. Now, when I do this, I don't want to put my glo this glove on and off again, and it seems like it's quite tedious to get the, the lighting here. I have this as a cheat, cheat thing here. So more or less in the shooting part of the, of the demo. Oh, okay. This is quite nice. The thing is, we now have two objects here. So what is happening here on the, in the example is we have only one point recognized at the center of mass of all the recognized points on the left side. So you could see, for example, that if I maybe hide this bigger circle, the small circle on the, uh, other, on the other canvas is moving towards this point here. So uh, this center of mass is the center of mass between those two locations. To make this, um, well, to make this debugging faster, I'm going to copy this color that I clicked on now, and I'm going to reinitialize the default colors because this seems to be a different green than from the marker. And I'm going to also lower the threshold a little bit because I'm getting here some green uh, values behind. Refresh the page. If I don't do this, then I'm more or less going to get very frustrated deve uh, developing because uh, I'm always going to have problems testing, like things interfering. And I don't want to do this updating threshold, updating color values every time. So it saves very much time to do this while developing. Okay, but how do we detect now two objects instead of just one object? I will show you a method. It's not the only method, but it's one method and it works pretty good. So we are going to study agglomerative clustering. So clustering is a method that finds groups of objects that are similar to each other and separates objects that are dissimilar in, in different clusters. So if we look at this image, there are actually some pixel values there that have coordinates. How agglomerative clustering works, it's a hierarchical method. It starts in the beginning with each point being its own cluster. So now in this image I have say 20 clusters. Each cluster has only one point. And then the method begins to merge points. It begins to merge them into bigger clusters. The smallest first all the time. And then the second one is maybe that one, the second smallest. Third smallest is maybe that one. But at some point, we begin to ask the question, OK, merging points is trivial because we already have a distance between points. But now my question is, when we start to merge clusters, what is a suitable distance between two clusters? And more or less, we have this situation here. And there are many ways of calculating distances between clusters. You may have heard of a method called single link. It only links, uh, it, it measures the distance between them as the minimum distance between any points in the two, two different clusters. I'm not exactly sure, but I think this is called complete link. It's taking the furthest points from the two clusters. You can even try to average, get the centroid 
get the center location of each cluster, consider that as the distance. But what we're going to do today is a method called average link. You just sum up all these distances between every point in one cluster and every point in the other cluster, uh, all pairs, and then divide by how many of these links exist. So this one we implement because it's going to be working quite nicely. I have tested these other ones, and even though they are very good for their res for respective applications, this average link tends to be okay for our case, this, uh, this type of case. Okay, so let's begin with the easy part. Everything in its own cluster, and then start to merge the nearest pair. So I'm going to write a function here. Hmm? Oh, okay. So where, where are we getting actually this location? We are getting it here in processing video frame. We're getting the pointer location, which is the average of all, all locations. So here, instead of pointer location, I want to get two locations because two, two markers here. Okay, so I'm going to write a function that says do clustering with the locations and a parameter 2. I'm expecting to find two clusters there. Clustering problem is usually divided in solve the number of clusters and find the clusters, but uh, very often you give the number of clusters with some kind of a priori knowledge. So let's see how this function looks like. Function do clustering Mm, let's call them points, it's better uh, somehow terminology. So points and uh, k for the number of clusters. And we said that we start off with everything in its own cluster, right? So let's say clusters equals a new array. And for each point, I'm going to add to this clusters array with the push operation. So this one is like in a stack. It adds to the end of the clusters array. I'm going to push an array that contains only the ith point. So I'm preparing that uh, clusters are going to be arrays of points. And at the moment, all of them, each of the clusters has only one point and everyone is a different point. So this is what we have here, the initialization. And now what we need to do is we are going to start merging. How much, how long am I going to merge? I'm going to merge until the length, sorry, the length of the clusters is greater than k. So when I'm going to reach exactly k clusters, two clusters, I'm going to stop merging. And then at the end, I'm going to return the clusters array at the end. So how do we merge? Well, let's say pair is equal to get nearest pair, pair of clusters. Okay, this is a function that I'm going to have to implement. And once I have my pair, this is just going to say cluster I, cluster J. So the first cluster, the second cluster. So now this pair, uh, what do I do with the clusters array? I have to put the elements from, let's say, the second cluster into the first and remove the second cluster from my list. So I can do that, for example, by clusters of the first item in the pair is equal to, again, the same items from inside this cluster, concatenating them 
with the cluster uh, with the points from inside the second cluster. So this JavaScript function more or less merges two arrays. So I have here the first cluster and the second cluster. It merges them and returns the result uh, overwriting the first cluster. So this one contains now both uh, points from both pairs. And I still have to remove the cluster at index pair of one. Otherwise, I have redundant points. So I'm going to say clusters splice. So this is the removing function in JavaScript. And I have to give it an index and how many items I want to remove at this index one. OK, so more or less, this is the clustering algorithm. I just need the way to get the nearest pair like I was showing in the slides before. So get nearest pair in a set of clusters. I'm going to try all possible pairs and see which one is the nearest. So that's, that's the straightforward way to do it. Now, I don't have to um, really do this. I can just, um, so this would uh, try number of clusters squared number of operations, but I don't have to do the symmetric ones. So I only need to calculate distances in half of this uh, matrix, if you will. So I can do here j from i plus 1. And I can make this for loop uh, and that cluster's length minus one. So I'm only testing uh, half of them because it won't make any, any difference anyway. So the distance between cluster A and cluster B is going to be the same as cluster B and cluster A. I don't have to do this check. OK. So what is the distance? Well, the distance is going to be get cluster distance between clusters of i and clusters of j. So this is going to be my distance. And if this distance is going to be smaller than whatever we previously calculate, so let's call this mean distance which we initialize up here with okay. yeah good so every time you get a newer distance you update it with uh, with that one so our minimum distance is going to be the new distance but I'm also going to keep track of this pair so I'm, I'm returning a pair right so pair I initialize it with 0, 0. So that means the f distance from the first cluster to the same first cluster. It's a, it can be anything here. This will become updated all the time. Uh, a new distance is found, and the distance between two clusters is not going to be infinity. So this will happen like that. The first pair, well, I could say pair is equal to i and j. So where did we find this minimum distance? At the i and j indices. And this is the pair that I'm going to return here. And the final thing that we have to do to get this done is how do we calculate the distance between the two clusters? We said let's try this average link method. Others are equivalent here, but um, you can study this more in clustering courses when you will take clustering courses on clustering. So get the distance between two clusters, cluster A and cluster B. We said we calculate all pairs, all pairwise distances first. So let's say 
sum pairwise distances is equal to zero, I'm going to get through go through all elements. of the first cluster and I'm going to get go through all the elements of the second cluster and now I have to calculate the distance between the point I already have a distance function so this is now point was point wise distance function between the point at index i in the first cluster and what do I write here? Okay. Some small sounds, but uh, is everybody following? Okay. So we calculated the distance between uh, these points. So now this dist starts to be one by one all of these blue lines here. One by one they are being calculated, this dist value, and we are also adding them up to this the sum of the pairwise distances. And we said we want to use the average. So average distance is the sum divided by how many distances there are. It's the product of this times this. Right? OK. And this is the value that we return, so this average distance. Everything is done. So these three three functions get nearest pair using the get cluster distance. And how many times do we get the nearest pair and merge? So this is where we are doing the merging. Until we are gonna have exactly k points there, uh, clusters there. And how many clusters we have? Um, we will look for we will look for two different clusters always. So this is going to be our solution here. Okay. You know what? This code is becoming a little bit confusing here. I'm going to do a small modification to this move pointer. Uh, event here. We are not moving a pointer now anymore. Okay, we are handling gestures. We are uh, going to do something more complicated than moving a pointer. So let's call it uh, do gesture. Do gesture. And um, I want to do this clustering step inside this do gesture there and let's take all of these things here and I'm gonna modify here instead of putting the pointer location here I'm just gonna give all the locations that are belonging to the same green color so I'm go going to give all the green locations in to this to this event here And now in the move previously called move pointer, and now it's called do gesture, I don't have location anymore. I have locations, so all of them there. And here is where I paste my code. Pointer location I don't really need anymore because uh, now we have the clusters so I'm gonna remove this from here I'm still going to draw pixels in blue to mark 
them, but uh, I'm not going to mark. Yeah, let's do separately. Let's say draw the first cluster in blue and the second cluster in red. So now I'm going to expect to see different colored um, markers above the video image. And then uh, on the second canvas on the right, well, we could put two circles now. Let's see where they are. So this doesn't exist anymore. Let's call it centroid A and centroid B. So what are centroid A and centroid B? They are average clusters first cluster and the average of the second cluster. Phew. If this works, I'm really good, but I have, <laughs> suspicious. I have my suspicions that this won't work. <laughs> I think this is the longest piece of code writing it in, in uh, at the same time. So, come on, errors. Refresh the page. Ah. Okay, cannot read property length of undefined. There are two circles there, which is quite interesting. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, something is interesting. Something is actually maybe working here, but the light in this room is horrible. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm not sure if you can see well enough, maybe if I zoom in a bit, but I do have two colors here. There is one red one there and one big blue one here. I have to keep this, okay, sometimes strange things happen, see? Now I'm, they are mixed because there are no pixels found in this area. Mm. So this light is very, very uh, strange today. Okay, and sometimes they, they can change direction. I don't know if you notice because uh, I see it in real time here, but there you see it in, in slow motion. So sometimes this is the red one, the one on the right. So, okay, the error here, oh yeah, so the error here is appearing because I am sometimes clustering um, when there are no locations found. So, if you don't have any points to cluster, it's gonna still try to cluster, but this is gonna be empty, and then I'm gonna try to access the first cluster and the second cluster. So problems uh, start to be here. So let's say if if no locations. Okay. Maybe not equal zero, no. we put everything in there. <laughs> yeah, so there are a few problems with uh, this idea. It may not be defined there. Yeah. You don't have any location. No, no. Uh, they are coming. So here, the locations is going to come from this identify pointer function. And uh, this is defining something, but it may be an empty array if nothing fits this distance criteria here. Mm. So the locations is going to exist, but if it's empty, oh, it's empty. Uh, yeah. if it's empty, there won't be two clusters there, and then my code always expects two clusters. Mm. So actually, I did get the suggestion to do this, and I can do it, but it becomes very hard for me to write code if these indents start to be more and more to the right. 
Um, I should export this as a separate function maybe, but uh, let's... Okay, I'm gonna do something that you shouldn't do. Okay. <laughs> No go to statements or no uh, returnings in, in your in your functions before you are finalizing the thing because you read the code you read here and if you're a new new coder and you don't know that this function can terminate before you expect that you can always reach these lines so it can be very confusing if you fill this code with with these uh, return statements somehow. But this one should. You still have the comparison. Yeah. Yes, the last time. Equal. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you have no idea how valuable these tips are. <laughs> okay. Um, for consistency, let's keep also the blue cluster the bigger cluster. Okay. I'm going to still do some things now and we will have a break after maybe 10 minutes or so. So, okay, how big is a cluster? I could count the number of pixels, but what I would actually like to do, and it will help me in the second part of the lecture, I want to calculate the radius. So I need the center point, I already have this centroid A and centroid B, but how big is the radius of the first cluster and how big is the radius of the second cluster? So the distance from the centroid to the farthest most point in its own partition is called. Okay, so I'm gonna say here radius A is equal to get cluster radius, centroid A, and the first cluster, and radius B, centroid B, and the second cluster. And here, after I get it, I need to write this function. I'm going to use the radius to make the circles on the right canvas uh, different size corresponding to the sizes of the uh, blue and red marked pixel areas on the left. So get cluster radius shouldn't be too difficult. Oops, not, not in this function. Get cluster radius and uh, here centroid partition if you want to respect the terminology in, in, in clustering. So, well, the maximum distance from the centroid to the points. So I'm going to have a distance initialized with zero. going through the partition, calculating the distance between the centroid and each element in the partition, if it's bigger than what we have so far, we keep it. And this max distance is going to be the radius. So uh, the cluster radius is the maximum distance between the centroid and all the other points. Okay. Uh, refresh the page. Do you do like a um, check on maximum distance because it keeps seeing stuff on top of the screen? Yeah. I could do checks, but this would make some kind, somehow the, um, how to say, it sees points on the top of the screen. This is not, uh, if, if I 
start to write now constraints here, I'm mixing the modules. So I have a module that should identify these green locations well. If these locations are not well identified, now I have some points here on the tops, top part of the screen, uh, then this module would need work. It would need, for example, uh, outlier removal or some kind of a more, more sophisticated method. Uh, if I put a... Okay, so sometimes this works, sometimes this, this doesn't now. But if I put now constraint at the maximum distance, is because I know that this is causing problems and then it can result in some kind of spaghetti code in the end. Can you use the knowledge of how small is the circle so you could extract it, but because you have some extra information like the uh, camera distance bit, bit, uh, to the circles or color taxi? Well, I would prefer not to because, um, I mean, then you would end up having these kind of issues like you can only test the application if you are at a certain distance from the camera. Yeah. Or you would need some kind of marker that is recognized correctly yeah. and depending on its size you can estimate the distance to the camera. Yeah. So it adds very much uh, complications, I think. So you want to find a function that actually checks that it's a circle with density points? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do that, but it's <laughs> we are talking too too many uh, complicated things. So I'm gonna do that, and um, yeah, and now it seems okay. <laughs> so sometimes the <laughs> solutions are the are the simplest ones. Just move the thing so that uh, smart but it's this green line on the on the side that is causing problems with, with this. So lighting is still bad, but in, in this case it's a bit more tolerable. Now, one more thing before we, we do the break. So I don't know if you are noticing it, but I still haven't solved the problem. Sometimes this becomes the red cluster and this becomes the blue. It's very, very short time and uh, um, if you are not, if you don't see this in real time, you're not going to notice it. So just trust me that the order in which the clusters are formed can, can change. So I'm going to say the blue to be always the one with the largest radius. Okay, now it was a little bit, maybe, maybe you saw it. Okay, great. That is the one thing that we're going to do, and then another thing, and then the break. So, the first thing is just a swap. So, when we are calculating this radii, okay, if radius B is bigger than radius A, Okay, now it's the time when working a bit more object-oriented would have helped because now I have to swap the centroid, the cluster, and the radius. If, if these informations like the radius, the centroid, and the cluster points would be in one object, then I could swap the objects. But, uh, yeah. I did the swap on the radius. I'm going to do a swap on the centroids. <coughs> Please check if what I'm doing is good because uh, I may make some mistakes sometimes. And a swap on the cluster <coughs> points because I am displaying them or drawing circles or, or whatever uh, later. Yes. I don't think should 
Yes, I don't really need it. Yes. And now, since they are swapped, it should be so that the bigger one. There are lines like you didn't use the off at all, like the second line here. Ah, thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So the auxiliary variable is should come back to yeah. the, the second one. I think this is correct. Um, I want to display the blue and red after I do the swap. Okay, otherwise it's, I will get confused there. Okay. And one more big problem with this clustering method. Um, okay, I... Yeah, the big problem with this clustering method <coughs> is it's very slow. It's very slow. It's not a very good clustering method, this agglomerative clustering. The reason I implemented it is because it's the easiest I know to implement. If I move this to the front of the webcam, my computer will start to lag and it's going to start to do some very strange uh, noises very soon. It's now dead, more or less. <laughs> okay, it's, it's better. Um, because uh, I believe time complexity is going to be now ordo n cube, if I'm not wrong, and uh, well, at this level here where it works, maybe these are 500 points, maybe. If you cube the 500 points, you will be in the range of millions. <coughs> but if you do this, now you have maybe 1,000 points, a few thousand points. If you cube that, you're going to be in hundreds of millions. You're, you're going to go much, much higher up or even billions. 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 It depends uh, how many points there are. Have you tried to take every fifth pixel so you could sample it? It would make it faster. Then you can bring it closer. Ah, it would. It should work. Well, thank you for the solution. <laughs> so I don't want this application to lag. I'm going to subsample the points. If I have more than, let's say, 200 points, I'm gonna keep 200. I would not keep the fifth pixel, but I would randomize. Mm. Yeah. It's going to make it a bit less uh, robust, but I would still prefer that solution because the fifth pixel, um, maybe I'm going to start getting just the points in the beginning and then the end remains empty. So quick function, okay, two minutes and break for uh, randomizing an array. I'm going to call it shuffle array. I'm going to go through each item of the array. I'm going to get a random index. That is a whole number. Okay, this needs to be actually multiplied by array length here. It's not a parameter. So getting a random index from the array and um, swapping. I should implement the swap function, but uh, let's do this. So I take the i element, I keep it. I replace it with the one at this random location and then the one at the random location becomes the one stored in the auxiliary variable. I return the array, my clustering function while, sorry,
Okay. So this should be random subsampling of the clusters. I'm shuffling it, and then I'm keeping the first 200 elements only. And now what will happen is, if I refresh this, and if I'm going to get this very close, you're going to start to see this uh, sparse points that are somehow okay okay now i pressed on my shirt and my head seems to be red <laughs> pixels and my shirt seems to be blue pixels but they are um they are not all the pixels there so now i'm covered in in blue and red pixels because apparently my hair forms a small cluster and my shirt makes a big cluster which is ni nice <laughs> i guess <laughs> but um you can see that the method is not breaking even though i have such big clusters at this at this point so now we will have 10 minutes break and meanwhile i'm gonna have to figure out what to do with the lights here because uh, i want to demonstrate well it's not working so you can ask questions during the break and uh, 10 minutes, so 20 past. I have to ask you, have you, uh, do you want to invest in uh, colored lights, for example, a cheap LED light? will give you a constant light and it would make it very sharp and easy to check the threshold would be small or even the laser pointer so that you could have less, less, less in glove and it would make it uh, independent of the light because it's so bright so mm -hmm. it's easy to check now there are some good lights I, I agree with you, okay Yeah. if I would like to make this demo in class yeah. work perfectly I could do all kinds of tricks yeah. I could even put infrared lights in my gloves or something and then I don't even have uh, lights. You don't even see the light anymore. You would, uh, only the computer would see it. But I want to make this application at some point so that anybody can play it. Yeah. And uh, making this costs nothing. <laughs> but buying lights as a, in, if anybody would like to try to build this application, it's expensive. Yeah. So uh, the, pro the thing in this room is a big problem that uh, my webcam is not very good. And also the light here is horrible. It's coming from the top. If you look here, my paper is in full shadow. OK? Yeah. And if I rotate just slightly, just slight rotation here it changes the colors entirely so I am in very 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 bad circumstance in the room now uh, if I select this it works but uh, you can you can see how it stops working with the minimum of, of uh, rotation change so what I'm going to try I'm going to try to go back here more to the back so that the light comes like that. Maybe I'm going to click on it now. Still not very good. Maybe I'm going to also rotate this slightly so that I have these less things bothering me on the side. And maybe I'm going to increase now the threshold because before I lowered the threshold very much. So I lowered the threshold ridiculously much because I had um, I had problems on the background. I had many. You could see these yeah. green things and whatever. So I'm going to put the threshold back to 25. It's a little too high. 
sometimes uh, there are a few other points that are coming, maybe 20. I think now it's quite good, but um, yeah, so I need to now test using this kind of... Uh, okay, so now this is actually quite stable. Uh, you can see how that the circles on the right are rotating very well, but um, it really needs to have not a clean background, but uh, no green or, or whatever, so these are problematic. But uh, yeah, I think that I could test quite quite well here. Maybe I can even try the amazing glove. <laughs> I don't know if it's, uh, it's a little different green green color here. Okay. Okay, you are now actually getting a little bit of a hint of how I'm going to detect the states. So what happens to those two circles there? Uh, in this In this case. You can see that the clusters are actually uh, part of what we consider the same cluster, visually. But that causes my circles on the right to always intersect. Mm -hmm. So I will explain this later. But if I do this, there is no intersection anymore. So this is the reason why I wanted to have the cluster, uh, the radius for the, for the clusters. Mm -hmm. Um, because I want to use the properties of the circles that are intersecting and, and not to identify the two different states. Well, during the whole, I have to say the, the clustering method is now even though slow, but it was top sample and it's a nice combo because uh, the way you choose the size of the cluster somehow supports the idea because the, uh, the way the clustering uh, aglo, aglo, more, aglo, agglomerative, agglomerative uh, clustering works, it, it makes it compact somehow. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's getting the maximum. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, it works in a decent way, assuming the proper threshold is set, assuming the green stuff is not bothering me anymore. Uh, the problem with the method is it needs this subsampling to work. And this is now a random subsampling happening. Okay? So it adds randomness. It could have all the points selected from one cluster. It's uh, unlikely, but it is possible. So it's prone to have uh, these type of errors appearing. I highly recommend trying other clustering methods here. Maybe you could consider uh, centroid partition based clustering like K means. You could consider even uh, this uh, random swap uh, algorithm. It's uh, actually the one that I demonstrated last time on, uh, on my main page here. the flash code that doesn't start. <laughs> so, It's already outdated for like. Okay, so this is K means. You can see now this interface is telling me to drag this point here because K means that did as much as it could do in this situation. 
it stopped, uh, it converged to a place. Uh, K-means is like a hill climbing method. It found now a stable place that cannot be um, improved anymore by its means of relocating centroids and uh, repartitioning. So it needs some kind of help, like that I would take this point from here, move it here, and then K-means will continue to iterate. It will continue to improve and find the general good structure. But you can see that when I just start K-means uh, from the beginning, sometimes it will work perfectly, but sometimes it will create these problematic clusters, like uh, structural uh, problems here. Sometimes it creates more of them, sometimes it creates less of them. If I try to start uh, like uh, multiple times, and this random swap algorithm from here, it uh, combines k means with this just random relocation of a centroid. So it does these kind of uh, random iterations where it chooses a centroid randomly, it moves it to another location, and then iterates k-means again. And this is much uh, stronger algorithm, and it's not going to get stuck in local optimum uh, so, so frequently. So you can see that those pluses and minuses are somehow disappearing without me interfering anymore. Now, this is slowed down algorithm one what you see here in the visualization and uh, uh, it's much faster if you just run it normally but uh, eventually all of them seem to be yeah all of them seem to be stopped it's a bit more powerful than what it seems because when the structural issues appear in k-means you don't necessarily need to drag this one to fix the problem it says here to drag this one and to put it here. But if I'm going to drag, for example, this one and put it maybe here, it's enough for k-means afterwards to solve the problem anyway. Sometimes. <laughs> okay, it didn't. Let's try again. So let's take this one from here and put it here now this time. Okay, so now k-means could fix it. So uh, doing a random um, relocation like this enables k-means even if it's not the perfect move, the perfect possible move. So anyway, this is a side discussion, but I would use this algorithm here instead, instead of this uh, agglomerative uh, method, but um, yeah, but it's uh, harder to implement. So I, I wanted to do something that I could implement in class and uh, not spend all the time for how clustering works. Do you think, in, additive, in addition to your good explanation how, how K-means works, uh, would it be a good starting position for changing the agglo thing to, to K-means such that you have already this uh, maximum extent of your points, so you take them and you know that you don't need two clusters, so you just take the midpoint of this vector and start with clustering with, with those endpoints as centroids, so it would quickly converge to two different clusters probably. Yes, we so you are now talking a problem specific implementation, yeah. you are now expecting two clusters always and if you initialize the centroids with the farthest two points, it probably is going to be a better initialization for k means. Yeah. But. Um, if it's problem specific. Uh, yeah, it's problem specific, but sometimes if you want your solution to be fast and if you want your solution to be, to be good, you can avoid textbook solutions and make something in favor of your current situation. Okay, I think we are continuing now. So I played a little bit with these threshold values during the break. I found the threshold of 20 to be quite okay. 
and well, this color. I don't know if I changed the color value, but uh, okay, I did change it a, a little bit. Probably I clicked on something. So, <clears throat> yeah. So we are back. And I, I also moved my laptop so that I don't have the smart board behind because there are some green pixels there that are affecting my, my testing. Uh, what Yuhani mentioned before, so yeah, if these kind of small green things appear here and there, you could fix it by adding another module, by adding some kind of a, like outlier detection module. If you have just few pixels here and there without uh, generating a cluster structure like here, you can remove them and ignore them from computation. So have maybe outlier removal step between this step and um, the clustering step. But uh, I wouldn't mix in the clustering that uh, somehow if your radius is too big, like absurdly big because of some outlier point, then try something else. Yes? I think that in this case, the subsampling would, would fix, you wouldn't need to do the outlier, you wouldn't need to do the outlier technique, you would do subsampling because there's, it's much more likely that the points will appear the color in somewhere else, I think. Well, I am doing the subsampling now. So, random subsampling. Are you now saying that it's likely for a sparse point to disappear? Yes. Okay. I would say that each point has equal probability to disappear. I'm not sure. I may be... Yes. You, you, are, you are correct. Uh, so you are proposing that subsampling actually act, acts as an outlier removal. You could be correct, but I, I, don't, I haven't investigated so much. Uh, anyway, with the subsampling and also these new values, I tend to have now isolated these, these clusters quite well. And now I want to show to you these, uh, this strange situation here. So this is now the secret to how my hand gestures are going to be recognized. Um, okay. Just a second. Okay, let's make this screen here smaller and I want to zoom in a little more. So this is what's going to happen when I want the web to go in a specific direction from the bigger circle to the smaller circle, okay? So this is the shooting state. But look what happens to the circles, like the, the circles there, when I hide now the, let's say, the smaller circle. So now the two clusters have to be from, from this same part. But these two clusters are not spherical anymore. They are more or less half circles or some, some kind of strange yin-yang shape maybe. <laughs> anyway, the result of this is that on, on this side, the circles are separating in the shoot state but they are not separating in this idle state or the grabbing, the grabbing state. So that's what I'm going to use to detect. And this, uh, oops, okay, I have also a, an example here where uh, this situation may happen if I move my hand uh, like, like this too much. So you may have uh, deformed clusters like this but uh, it seems to work quite well also with this situation. So I, I, I thought I have white paper here. So. No. So this situation here also has to be handled. Nothing is there. I would like to delete the web or maybe I would like to... Uh, well, now it's not updating anymore because no, no values are. 
are appearing. So, um, yeah, let's leave this like that. Um, if it wasn't already clear, so the shooting direction is going to come from this vector. Uh, the idle and grab states, we are not going to consider the two circles anymore, but we are checking if this intersection is happening, and if so, our grab location is just the average of all the points. And this is now the gesture activation sequence. So from the beginning, this means idle state. You can shoot, you can grab and move around, and you can also delete. You can also immediately delete after shooting, and delete starts all over again. Like a kind of state machine. Yeah, it's a state machine, if you want to be fancy, <laughs> call it like that. So this is now what we are going to try to implement. So this do gesture function, um, there is a gesture even when location is empty, right? It's the delete gesture. So it's wrong to make the event appear only when there are green points in the screen. So now when we are having no green points in the screen, the delete gesture is, is already there. Okay. But now the clusters. So I have here radii computation, I'm drawing pixels there, but if the distance between the two centroids, so the distance between centroid A and centroid B is bigger than radius A plus radius B, what does it mean? Do not overlap. No yes, it means that the circles do not intersect. They are they are separated. So if they are separated, shoot from centroid A to centroid B. Otherwise either be idle if there is no web at all present or if there is web grab the web and where do I grab it well now I don't have clusters anymore I mean I do I use them for the circle intersection detection but uh, more or less I can just use the locations that are coming by default and I can say here the average of these locations is going to be my grabbing point. Something like that. Okay. Okay. I could even go a little more uh, further and draw the pixels in blue and, um, and red. Okay, let's make blue and, and black. I don't want to use so many colors. And um, here, let's make black all the locations. So somehow indicating that we don't have two clusters anymore. We are just uh, showing the one, one circle there. So I'm changing a little bit the interface and I'm also not going to draw circles anymore on the right side because I'm going to start to add particles now. Okay, for the moment, uh, refresh the page. So now one circle is black, the other circle is blue. Um, 
they are intersecting, they are not intersecting. This seems to be okay. I'm not going to use anymore the canvas on the right for debugging. I'm going to not show these circles here. And okay, they are not disappearing. I'm sorry, so this should disappear. Um, it just returns the, the value here, but uh, clear canvas. Uh, should be also done. Okay, this is uh, clear canvas. Okay, so delete is there, shooting is there not shooting so now this cluster is just black so I remove the emphasis on this canvas and start to think about particles um, so I don't need this piece of code anymore it was just for debugging for debugging circle intersections okay so about the particles, I'm going to go back to our physics example, okay? And I have to remind what this is. So small rigid body simulating engine for, for physics. Uh, we had here the possibility to remove links by pressing them so the motivation was that if I remove now the leg of this one person he will fall somehow in a almost realistic way but if you look on the top this thing that is moving I also have the possibility to define a point as static that doesn't move and if I remove some links there, this pendulum, this movement, this is what my web is going to be like. Okay? So, going back to the PowerPoint slides, my web is going to be some particles coming from the bigger cluster towards the smaller cluster with the velocity. In time, they will look like that. Maybe we will also add some a bit randomness in this direction, but let's let's see about that. So they will look like that. We will connect them with rigid segments. If you remember, the rigidness of the segments had a, a number of iterations. If we re, um, lower the iterations for this rigidity, it's going to be more elastic. A little bit. Anyway, you will hopefully remember after we put the code in. Uh, let's begin with this part. So I'm going to just copy the code from that previous, previous exercise and explain it very briefly here. So what do we have? here we had a particle class that gets a location and a velocity a segment defined between two particles okay and our particle class it had this draw regular polygon function so it could be drawn as some kind of polygon but now I'm going to replace it with the draw circle function that we just defined in the beginning of the lecture because the regular polygon we don't have it here um, on the canvas at the location and uh, let's put a radius of let's say two okay the segment defined between two particles it's drawn as a line that function is actually here Okay, and then an array of particles and an array of segments, it's empty, and the gravity initialized with some, some value. 
the simulate physics function is the hard one, okay? Plenty of linear algebra here. We upload the location of all the particles, if any, now we have zero, with their um, own velocity calculated through Verle integration, so from the old location to the new location, adding also gravity to them, uh, and then applying constraints. So this is what controls the rigidity. We have many iterations in which any points that are too far away or too close than what the initially defined segment length should be, they are being uh, moved towards their respective direction with a small value, so this difference divided by 20 I have there. If you're going to iterate more than 50 times, you're going to get more and more rigid. Everything is going to uh, stabilize more. If you're going to lower this, you're going to get more elastic. And finally, particles, keep particles on the screen, so if the particles would go away from the screen, I just stop them. So I hope you remembered this lesson, <laughs> because now we are going to add them. So I'm going to go to this shoot, and when I shoot, I'm going to say, okay, sorry, um, the, the simulate physics function that I called, it needs to be, that I included has to be called somewhere so I need to put it in my let's say main function and uh, it needs a canvas right yes so I simulate the, the physics on canvas B and when I shoot I need to create a new particle at the location, so my location is going to be centroid A, the bigger, bigger cluster. My velocity is going to be coming from centroid B and centroid A, right? So it's going to shoot from centroid A to centroid B. So this is Okay, but this is going to make it very, very fast. I mean, um, the distance between these two is very big. I'm going to scale it down a little bit. Maybe, let's say, 0.1. So this is going to be the velocity that the particle is leaving. And I need to add it to my particles array because this array is the one that is being processed in the simulate physics. So any particle is now going to be handled at an interval of 40 milliseconds. So yeah, I save the file. go back here and refresh the page so <laughs> particles are shooting <laughs> according to whatever my my orientation here is now it's more or less like a fountain, they are going up, but at some point uh, gravity is going to start to pull them down again. Okay. It's quite nice. They are going very, very slowly on purpose because uh, you need to see it uh, in this. So the, the recording system is very slow and uh, laggy, so... Yeah. Okay but they are not connected, so I need segments between these particles and I think that they are actually 
way too close to each other. I think there are too many particles here. So I'm going to not create a particle every time on every frame. I'm going to skip some frames on, on random. I'm going to make this decision. So let's do this here at the new particle. When we create a new particle, let's decide if we want to create it. So if the value, random value between 0 and 1 is less than, let's say, 0 0.4. So what does this 0 0.4 mean? If it's 1, it's always 1, right? So that would be the maximum particle amount. So particle amount. If I put it 0, the amount is going to be 0. So particle amount, global variable, between 0 and 1. Refresh the page. There are a bit less particles. Sometimes there are some gaps there, sometimes longer gaps, sometimes smaller gaps. Less consistent. It, to me, this looks more, uh, somehow, more realistic. OK. <clears throat> so we have the particles, but not the segments. And uh, the particle, wow. OK. And I said I want to delete also the particles when this is not in the in the screen right so let's handle that first in this delete here I'm just gonna say particles equal new array and segments is equal to new array so this is gonna just remove everything from the from the screen um, but what was I doing? Okay, yeah, so segments. I need to connect the new particle to any to the previous particle to make it like a line. Okay, so if a new particle is coming, if previous particle exists, I link it. So if the particle's length is going to be more than one, a new segment between yeah this is getting very very bad code here I just write it here so you can see everything. So I will put it proper place after. So a segment between the last particle and the second last particle. Okay. And I need to add this to my segments array. That's it. Refresh the page. Okay, so now some kind of line is going there. But I said I want the points to be sticky, to get stuck on the side of the wall, right? So, oh, and now I deleted the web. So when this is not on the screen, it it just vanishes. Okay, so here we have in the simulate physics function, um, they stop there, but if you remember, our particle class has also this uh, option is static. So if it's static, it won't be affected by movement anymore. So that's what I'm going to do here. When it wants to get off the screen, it will go off the screen, but it will stay on the screen, but also 
it will become static. Okay. And our grab gesture, this is something we haven't done yet. So if we are in the grab state, I want to keep the last added particle in my hand. So part if there are particles, otherwise it's idle state. But if I have particles, I just say the last particle the location of that particle is equal to my average of all green values. Sim simple that. Okay, now shooting sticking Grabbing, pulling on the web. Okay, adding a few more particles by mistake. But more or less grabbing on the web. It's stuck on the wall. Okay. And deleting. <coughs> okay, almost done. So, what do I want to do now? This web is boring. We studied graphs, we studied neighborhood graphs, we studied K nearest neighbor, we studied Gabriel graphs, XNN graphs. I want to make this more of a graph. I want to add a little bit more links, um, maybe not just between the newest particle and the previous, but also between second previous, also random. It will sometimes make the web a little bit thicker, sometimes make the web a little bit thinner. Let's see how, how that one works. So here, where I'm generating the segments, if particles length is actually greater than two, so this is the part where uh, code starts to look a little bad. But um, let's fix it tomorrow in all the discussions. So tomorrow we can discuss about code and everything, but I will wrap it up today. So if the particles are more than uh, one there, more than two, so I'm going to link the uh, current particle also with the second last particle. But, again, I want a bit of randomness. I don't want it all the time to be linked like that. Or let's just leave it like this. It's way too complicated otherwise. OK. Refresh the page. So now, web looks a little bit more a little bit thicker. And it should somehow create some interesting structures on the wall there because of these added constraints. can kind of see it piling up there on the, on the wall sometimes in, in different ways because the distances between the particles are random. So it gives somehow a, an, interesting, an interesting effect here. Of course, I could still do the 
hiding it and I can still grab on it like that. Okay. Last thing. I'm going to make this canvas on the right um, I'm going to remove its background so it has a white background here but I'm going to remove the background and I'm going to put uh, absolute positioning so now they are going to be <coughs> on top of each other hopefully no? okay both of them need to be absolute positioning, sorry. Uh, yeah, the canvas item, the canvas CSS object. Okay, and now it's shifting a little bit, so margin left half the width. So now particles are actually coming from on top of the other canvas, but this black, I, I don't know. Well, white background, let's try it. So I'm going to copy this back to my um, canvas object here. So I remove the background, position absolute and align it so that it stays in the middle of the screen and that's it i think i put the glove on hopefully it works this is nice very white canvas I think I will need to make the particles move more. This looks very, very lame. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to change the color because they don't appear over my hand. Okay, so two things. Let's see if I can code with these special gloves. Uh, it's very difficult because my, hand, my fingers are tied together. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, velocity, let's make it 0.5 and um, draw line function, not nice code here, but I'm going to say stroke style is equal to yellow, orange, maybe. I don't know, something that is visible both over white and over black. And uh, the draw circle, let's fill it with yellow. So, I mean, orange. Okay, one more try. <laughs> okay, hopefully the more pool effect. Aha, uh -huh. what the? Oh, ah, okay, <laughs> it, very interesting. <laughs> uh, okay. bit laggy so hmm. okay now I'm grabbing it okay there was some error there so not perfect it's uh, coming when this light issue is is coming like uh, if I rotate too too much my hand then the shadow comes because this light is just above so I have to somehow be careful here but yeah something like that and okay it, it, it actually continues if I open the hands again so I can 
if it doesn't delete it, then it's going to make quite much web here that is uh, hanging there from the from the ceiling. Yeah, something is wrong. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, and now delete. <laughs> Okay.